know that most of what you've seen, read, or heard about Billy the Kid is untrue? My name is Gail Cooper. I'm a medical doctor and forensic psychiatrist. My specialty is murder case consultation for the defense. For 20 years, I've used my expertise to uncover the real Billy the Kid. Researching over 40,000 pages of archival documents and books, I've written the revisionist history. It's shocking, it's liberating, and I've written books demolishing the hoaxes, hijacking the history. My talks will share with you what I've found. Cover-ups, misinformation, and fakery, to use Old West lingo, will bite the dust. This talk exposes the brushy Bill stories faked jailing and trial of Billy the Kid in Brushy Bill Roberts's book, Alias Billy the Kid. The information is from my book, Cracking the Billy the Kid Imposter Hoax of Brushy Bill Roberts. The Brushy Bill story in Alias Billy the Kid had to create an autobiographical sounding version of Billy Bonnie Santa Fe jailing and murder trials in Mesilla, New Mexico Territory. Brushy Bill Roberts's coaching sources were Billy Bonnie's letters, Pat Garrett's 1882 book, The Authentic Life of Billy the Kid, and Walter Noble Burns's 1926 book, The Saga of Billy the Kid, and Brushy's Lincoln Tours with hoax mastermind William V. Morrison. For the Santa Fe jail stay, Brushy simply paraphrased Billy Bonney's jail letters to Governor Lou Wallace as collected for him by Morrison. And hoaxing writer of alias Billy the Kid, C.L. Sonishin, forged a better Brushy by fixing up his bad grammar. So Brushy, sounding like Sonishin, stated, I wrote to Governor Wallace to come and talk to me, but he failed to do so. The source footnote cites Billy Santa Fe jail letters. The one of January 1st, 1881s said, I would like to see you for a few moments if you can spare the time. March 4th, 1881 said, I wrote you a little note the day before yesterday, but have received no answer. I expect you have forgotten what you promised me this month two years ago, but I have not, and I think you had ought to have come and seen me as I requested you to. Also, don't miss Brushy's quote that he wrote to Wallace, which Sonishin forgot to edit out for the fake illiteracy claim. In reality, for lack of sources, Brushy and team fatally missed the dramatic history. Billy almost escaped the Santa Fe jail. He and his cellmates nearly tunneled out. That resulted in Billy being placed in solitary confinement on February 28, 1881, until transport to Mesilla for his trials. For Billy's Mesilla hanging trials, Brushy was quoted. In April, I pleaded to the federal indictment and it was thrown out of court. Recall that duped University of New Mexico press director E.B. Mann thought this was such a spectacular special knowledge that he accepted alias Billy the Kid for publication. Actually, Brushy parroted Billy's April 15, 1881 letter to his attorney, Edgar Capeless. Billy wrote, My United States case was thrown out of court and I was rushed to trial on my territorial charge. But that was all Brushy and team knew. The letter didn't give the circumstances. The authentic life of Billy the Kid didn't help. 
It stated erroneously, the outcome of the trial was that the kid was acquitted. The saga of Billy the Kid even wrongly listed the murder victim as Indian agent clerk Morris Bernstein and stated Billy was acquitted for lack of witnesses. Brushy's coach Morrison hid his own ignorance by double talk in his December 3, 1953 El Paso Rotary Club talk. He stated, the kid's federal indictment had been dismissed on plea to the jurisdiction of the court on April 6, 1881. In reality, Billy's March 30, 1881 hearing was for the regulator killing of Andrew Buckshot Roberts. Billy's loyal attorney, Ira Leonard, got the indictment quashed by Judge Warren Bristol on April 6th because its writer, U.S. Attorney T.B. Catron, had erroneously claimed the federally controlled Mescalero Indian Reservation as the killing site to make it federal indictment number 411. But the real site was Joseph Blazer's private property, making it a territorial, not federal case. So it was quashed on the technicality of wrong jurisdiction. That didn't mean Billy was acquitted. Brushy name dropped A.J. Fountain as his lawyer. He stated, he done all he could for me. The prompt source was still Billy's capeless letter. Billy wrote, Mr. A.J. Fountain was appointed to defend me and has done the best he could for me. In reality, fatally missed by Brushy was the disaster in Billy's Messia trials. His loyal attorney, Ira Leonard, abruptly quit after a likely ring threat after getting the Buckshot Roberts indictment quashed. Coach Morrison was to blame. His ignorance is evident in his March 17, 1954 letter to Arizona Highway Magazine's editor, Raymond Carlson. Excerpted, Morrison stated, until my research uncovered the actual records, every writer insisted that Ira E. Leonard represented the kid at his trial in Messia. Leonard was not even there. Still using the capeless letter, Brushy name dropped Billy's mare. He confabulated. They didn't sell my mare up at Scott Moore's in Las Vegas. He was a friend of mine, but now he said I owed him money to board. Billy had written, The mayor is about all I can depend on at present, so hope you will settle the case right away and give Fountain the money you get for her. In reality, Garrett's posse man, Frank Stewart, had stolen Billy's famous bay mare at Billy's Stinking Springs capture and had illegally sold her to Scott Moore, owner of luxurious Moore's Hot Springs Hotel in Las Vegas, New Mexico Territory. After his April 13th hanging sentence, Billy wanted to sell her to pay Fountain for an appeal. As he wrote in the capeless letter, Fountain is willing to carry the case further if I can raise the money to bear his expense. Brushy and team also didn't know why Billy contacted Capeless. In fact, he was the attorney Billy had hired for his replevin, meaning rustling, case against Frank Stewart for that mayor. For the Messiah trial, for the William Brady killing, Brushy merely calls it crooked and that he wanted so-called Hank Brown as a defense witness, but Pat Garrett wouldn't get him. The source footnote for a crooked trial is Maurice Garland Fulton's article in the New Mexico Folklore Records 1949 to 1950 volume titled Billy the Kid in Life and Books. Fulton called the trial unjust because Houston Chapman's murderer, James Dolan, got his case dismissed by T.B. Catron. In reality, Henry, not Hank, 
Newton Brown, was not a viable witness. He was Billy's fellow regulator, also indicted for Brady's killing, and had fled the territory. If real Billy had a witness wish list, he would have wanted John Squire Wilson, the Lincoln County War Period Justice of the Peace, who knew that Brady had refused to arrest John Tunstall's murderers, forcing him to deputize Billy and others to serve arrest warrants. Billy would have also wanted Juan Patron, the Hispanic community leader and jailer who housed him for his pardon bargains sham arrest and who had formed a citizens committee to protest Brady's shielding of Tunstall's murderers. And Billy would have wanted subpoenaed prosecution witness Isaac Ellis cross-examined as to the Lincoln County War skirmishes in which Ellis provided his Lincoln house as refuge for the regulators. Brushy concluded by making up that the Brady trial lasted a week when it lasted two days, April 8th to 9th, 1881. But the prompt source footnote of Doña Ana County court minutes let him lift the sentencing day as April 13th with hanging set for May 13th. For the transport from Mesilla to the Lincoln County Jail, Brushy gave bizarre detail 69 years later. Excerpted, he stated, John Kinney sat on the back seat beside me. Billy Matthews sat across and facing Kinney. Deputy U.S. Marshal Bob Ollinger sat beside Matthews facing me. Dave Woods and a couple of other guards rode horseback, one on each side, and the other rode behind the ambulance. They told me if anyone attacked, they would kill me first. We left Messia a little before midnight, so no one would know where we were. It took about five days to make the trip to Fort Stanton, where Garrett picked me up and took me to the jail in Lincoln. In fact, Brushy parroted his prompt source. Possibly, because that was obvious, Sonishin hid it. It was an April 15, 1881, Newman's semi-weekly article. Excerpted, it stated, On Saturday night, about 10 o'clock, Deputy U.S. Marshal Robert Ollinger with Deputy Sheriff David Wood and a posse of five men started for Lincoln with Henry Antrim, alias the Kid. The fact that they intended to leave at that time had been purposely concealed in order to avoid any possibility of trouble. Billy was handcuffed to the back seat of the ambulance. Kinney sat beside him, Ollinger on the seat facing him, Matthews on the seat facing Kinney, Lockhart driving, and Reed, Wood, and Williams riding along on horseback on each side and behind. Kidd was informed that if trouble should occur, he would be shot first. The authentic life of Billy the Kid had Garrett state, Billy was brought from Messia to Lincoln by Deputy Robert W. Ollinger and Deputy Sheriff David Woods of Doniana County and turned over to me by them at Fort Stanton, nine miles west of Lincoln. Next was the escape from the Lincoln County Courthouse Jail. Brushy's tale reveals Morrison's touring him to see it and Morrison's added input from old-timer Lincoln County resident Severo Gallegos. Morrison later used Gallegos for a fake affidavit that Brushy was Billy. Added were Brushy's staged crying in the upsetting courthouse jail and his identifying old-style shackles. Brushy says in 1881, the building had no outside stairs to the balcony. The prompt source was the authentic life of Billy the Kid. It stated, 
At the southwest corner of the building was a door leading to a small hall and broad staircase, which was the only means of access to the second story. Brushy saw the new stairs himself in his Lincoln tour. Brushy added that its second floor armory was across from Garrett's office. In reality, the armory was at the front to back hall's opposite south end. Across the hall from Garrett's office was a room which had held the Tularosa Ditch War prisoners during Billy's imprisonment, leading to one that had been the Masonic Hall in the past Murphy Dolan house. For the escape, the book's Better Brushy gave both popular scenarios for the killing of deputy guards James Bell and Robert Ollinger. To be recalled is that in the Governor Mayberry pardon hearing, real Brushy had denied killing them. For the gun placed in the outhouse one, Brushy identified the accomplice as Sam Corbett, misspelled. The prompt footnote for the erroneous Sam Corbett name is a July 1936 Frontier Times interview of a Leslie trailer of Galveston, Texas, titled Facts Regarding the Escape of Billy the Kid. Trailer collected old-timers hearsay. He got the Sam Corbett name from a Francisco Salazar. Excerpted, Salazar said his brother-in-law, Bonificio Baca told him, quote, that Sam Corbett left the gun in the jail latrine for the kid, that when the kid and Bell went to the jail latrine, when Ollinger had the other prisoners across the street for their midday meal, the noted desperado secured the gun and concealed it on his person, and on returning to the guardroom, as he ascended the stairway, he shot Bell through the heart. Also, in Sonishin's papers is Morrison's multi-page listing of sources. The Sam Corbett name came from July 17, 1938, New Mexico Sentinel articles titled Sam Corbett Writes of the Slayings and Tunstall's Father Learns of the Raids. In reality, Sam Corbett was just John Tunstall's past shopkeeper. Billy's likely accomplice was Gottfried Gauss, the courthouse's caretaker, John Tunstall's loyal past cook, and Billy's anti-ring friend since 1877. For the second scenario of escape by shackle slipping, Brushy claimed to use the free cuff to strike Deputy Bell, then shot him when he fled down the stairs. Ollinger is then shot from the window in the conventional scenario. For releasing the leg shackles, Brushy had an outdoor scene. He said, I told old man Goss, G-O-S-S, it was Gauss, G-A-U-S-S, to cut this chain between my legs. He tried to cut it with a saw. I told him to get the axe and cut it. I held a 44 on him. He cut the chain as I stood over a rock. This is a fatal error. Brushy was unaware that Gottfried Gauss was Billy's friend or that he was the likely accomplice. Instead, Brushy faked him as an enemy needing a pointed gun to force assistance. The source for the error of the leg chain being broken outside was the saga Billy the Kid, along with its misspelling as, quote, Old Man Gus, G-O-S-S. -S. Another source was Morrison's October 11th, 1949 interview with Lincoln old-timer Severo Gallegos. The prompt footnote quoted Gallegos. Goss, G-O-S-S, -S, the jail cook, cut the chain on the leg irons. Gallegos, as will be seen in a later talk, also used the saga of Billy the Kid for his malarkey. Knowing Billy went out on the courthouse's balcony, Brushy has him threatening people. Brushy stated, 
I called out that if anyone was looking for a six-foot grave, that they should follow me. The source was the saga of Billy the Kid's fiction, in which Billy can see dead Ollinger from that porch, though it faced north, and dead Ollinger lay at the east side of the building. It stated, Billy raised the shotgun and took deliberate aim. The dead man seemed to jump as the nine buckshot drove home. In a fatal error, Brushy missed that, in reality, from the balcony, Billy asked Gauss for a miner's pick, which Gauss handed up. Inside the courthouse, Billy then took hours to break the leg chain. During that, Billy repeatedly went out on the balcony to address assembled Lincolnites. No one tried to stop him. Though the Lincoln County War was lost, the townspeople could still save their freedom-fighting hero. Brushy gives an elaborate escape horse tale. He stated, Goss, as G-O-S-S, caught the horse behind the jail in the pasture. He and the Gallegos boy saddled the horse and took him to the front of the jail. I went back downstairs and out the front of the jail where the horse was tied. I jumped for the saddle but slid off, the other side hanging to the rope. The Gallegos kid went down the road and took a rope off a yoke of steers in the field and tied it to my saddle. I got on the horse and rode out of Lincoln. The source footnote for the horse fiction and the meaningless rope is Morrison's October 11, 1949 interview of Severo Gallegos. Excerpted, Gallegos said, Billy called to me through the upstairs window to help catch that horse. Goss, G-O-S-S, then caught the horse in the yard. Then Goss took the horse around to the front and into the street. Billy got on the horse. The horse started to buck, and Billy fell off and held to the rope. He told me to go down the road and get the rope from Presciano, who had a rope tied over the horns of the cow. I tied it around the neck of the horse and threw it on the saddle horn. In reality, Gallegos was garbling a fictionalized mention of himself in the saga of Billy the Kid, in which he and another child named Miguel Luna were portrayed as witnessing Billy's escape, and a Manuel Blandano as giving Billy a rope to picket the escape pony. In reality, Severo Gallegos was a known Lincoln County eccentric, aggrandizing himself with tall tales of Billy the Kid. In his August 6, 1948, Riadoso News interview with reporter Mary Nell Tager, he also gave the horse scene, which Morrison may also have lifted from. Excerpted, Diego stated, After Billy shot George the jailer, it was actually Bob Ollinger, Billy yelled to me saying, Severo, come help Gus, G-U-S, the cook in the jail get a horse and saddle him from the corral. I caught the horse, took him back to Billy. He mounted. That horse started bucking. Then Billy called to me, Severo, see that man in the field plowing with the steers and the rope around their horns? Go get it. I brought it back to the kid. He threw it around the neck of the horse, the saddle horn, and was off into Ventura Canyon. Diego's apparently lifted old-timer Miguel Luna's own fakery quoted in the saga Billy the Kid. Excerpted, Luna stated, I was a little boy and was spinning tops with Savaro, misspelled Diego's, when I heard the shot that killed Bell. I saw Ollinger run across the street and the kid lean out the window and shoot him down. Savaro Gallegos and I saw old Goss, G-O-S-S, chasing Billy Bird's pony in the jail pasture. Then we saw the kid bucked off. As he rode out of town, he met Manuel Blandano. 
Manuel had a new rope and Billy asked him for it to use in picketing his pony. In reality, the escape event had a different key object, a blanket. The escape horse was court clerk Billy Burt's pony. Billy realized that his severed rattling leg chains might spook the pony, so he had Gauss wrapped the blanket over the saddle, but it proved slippery and Billy slid off the bucking horse. Then Billy remounted and rode away. Known was Billy's crossing the Capitan Mountains, so Brushy said, I walked over the mountain. My guns began to get heavy, and I hung one of them in the fork of a tree. That fiction source was the saga of Billy the Kid. It stated that Billy was, quote, weighed down by guns stolen from the armory and traveling over the mountain roads on foot was wearing, so he hid one of his six shooters in the forks of a juniper tree. In reality, Billy rode Billy Bird's pony, which he promised to return. Only after he released the pony, presumably near his Las Tablas destination on the north side of the Capitan Mountains, was he on foot. Brushy then claimed known information that Billy went to his friend, Ahenio, misspelled Salazar. To explain why Billy didn't go to Old Mexico, Brushy confabulated a scene with Ahenio in which he, as Billy, declared that he was staying to kill John Chisholm, Barney Mason, and Pat Garrett. Brushy was unaware of Billy's sweetheart, Paulina Maxwell, which made him choose Fort Sumner to be with her. So, Brushy Bill's autobiography for Billy the Kid's jailing, trial, and escape showed no special knowledge, coaching by hoax accomplices, parroting of sources, confabulating fatal errors, and fatal ignorance, all proving he wasn't Billy Bonney and it showed the labor done by the hoaxers to trick readers. Talks to follow will debunk the Brushy Bill's story's death scene in Alias Billy the Kid.